Sarah, come in. Hi, come on over. Well, oh, you find me sitting at my desk, though. To be honest, I, I'm completely daunted by um, the state it's got into. Obviously, there's a lot of papers and a precarious pile of books, and um, not quite sure how I make any progress with it, really, but at some point I have to clear it and find the surface. But however, I am sitting here partly for the pleasure of contemplating. You may have noticed, it, I had it over there, but you may have noticed that there's a new portrait has arrived. This is Yeats, of course. And if you look, there's C.S. Lewis, the portrait called The Jack of Hearts, on the left side of my desk, and Yeats here. Two great Irishmen, of course, you know, uh, from Ireland before Ireland was divided, um, uh, who met each other, and I think I read you a passage once about uh, the meeting of, of Yeats and, and Lewis and how Lewis incorporated Yeats into one of his poems. Anyway, they're both by Ross Wilson, this Northern Irish artist whom I admire, and I, I had to go over to, to, to Antrim to, to do some work, actually, uh, with the Gettys about uh, about hymns and hymn writing, and Ross was there, and 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 uh, just as he was driving me to the airport, he suddenly produced out of nowhere this beautiful wrapping, and there it was, this fantastic, and it's rather nice. Let me show you. Uh, again, rather as he did with the Shakespeare, he's got, uh, you know, the the tools of the trade, the magical letters, as it were, of the alphabet, all in there. Um, and then, for Malcolm, 7th to 9th May 2021, my best regards, deep thanks. Rave on Mr. Yates. Well, Rave on Mr. Yates is a quotation, of course, from a Van Morrison song, Rave on John Dunn, but he has a Rave on, Rave on Mr. Yates, Rave on through the writing of a vision. The Many Thoughts of William Butler is the title of the painting. So, um, I'm thrilled to have that. Now, I tell you what, we've got to move books from off of here anyway. Let's move these three, which I had out, partly inspired by the Yates. Come and have a seat. And, um, we'll indulge ourselves. Um, one of Yeats's most famous poems, and many people would say, hands down, their favourite poem of Yeats is, of course, The Lake Isle of Inish Free, which is a glorious poem, and we'll read it in a sec. It actually, he wrote it very early in his career. It's like, it came out in the Rose, I think, in like 1893. Uh, and it's the full, you know, it's the real first flowering of the, that sort of early uh, kind of Celtic Twilight Yeats style, which as we know, he moved on from. But he was always kind of, in a sense, followed around by this poem because people just loved it so much. And it's a bit like, you know, a great person who's had a really massive early hit and then wants to develop, but it's like Roy Orbison always, you know, having to sing Only the Lonely or. Um, but people loved it for very good reason. Because it not only summons up a kind of beautiful image, but, um, but it, uh, it calls and draws. I mean, as you know, the last line of the last phrase of the poem is the deep heart's call. And it's not just about a place, a lake island in Ishfree, the lake isle that Yeats as a young man used to fantasise that he would live on as a kind of isolated mystic and hermit and that he kind of yearned towards when he was in London. But it's something deeper. It's, a, it's about the inner country, the inner soul of the heart, uh, the, the, the inscape, as Jared Manley Hopkins put it. Anyway, let's just um, hear it because it's so beautiful. Um, unusually for Yeats, it's written in this slightly longer line. It's got six stresses. You feel the length and slowness and pleasure of it because it's, he allows himself six stresses rather than five in each line, except for the four in the final lines. Anyway, here we go. It's so good. The Lake I live in is free. I will arise and go now and go to Inish free, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee-loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, 
For peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Ah, it, it's a magnificent poem. And that ending where he says, For always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey. And... Um, it was only after I'd already come to know and love this poem that I found in Yeats's um, autobiographies his account uh, of uh, how he came to write this poem. You know, I imagined him somehow in some beautiful place in Ireland already in a lovely spot, perhaps looking out to the island and the lake and thinking I must go out to that island. But of course, I should have looked at the poem more closely because he mentions the pavement's grey. Well, the pavement grey that he was stood on in the 1890s was Fleet Street in London, you know, the centre of the newspaper world and publishing. And there he was trying to make his way in London. And he, he was, this is what Yeats tells the story. He was walking down, you know, feeling disconsolate and exiled from Ireland. And his eye was caught by a shop display window in one of the shops in Fleet Street. And of course they had very you know, elaborate, beautiful window dressing. And somebody had set up a little fountain, a little water feature in this shop window in Fleet Street and the fountain was jetting up and they balanced a little ball on the top of the fountain and it was playing like that with the fountain up and you could just hear uh, what actually attracted Yeats he says was the tinkling sound so he could somehow maybe the shop door was open or something but he could hear the little tinkling sound of the water and suddenly out of out of Im immemorable depths rose in his mind the thought of the lake water lapping uh, by the Isle of Inishfree. And he basically went home and wrote the poem. But I find that extraordinary. But even the smallest, even the most trivial, you know, tinselly, commercialised, unpromising thing, provided it has one of these deep elements like water in it and the sound of water, can suddenly trigger out of unknown depth something in the deep heart's core. And I absolutely love the way that happened. And it's very similar to him, well, there's Yeats and there's, of course, Jack Lewis, the Jack of Hearts, C.S. Lewis. And he tells the story about how he had an, a, a stab of joy deep, deep in the Deep Hearts Core when his brother brought in a little model garden in a, the lid of a biscuit tin that he'd made with mosses and things like that. And Lewis was only three or four and he saw his older brother and built this little garden. And, uh, you know, doubtless we looked at it now, it's like a little kid's Easter garden. But somehow just that was enough to trigger. We carry in us these great depths and sometimes even a small thing will open them up. And of course the poet's job is to find and take that small thing and then open it up. So there's the Lake Isle of Inish Free. Now I had this out. I actually, I love that poem. And in fact, I myself have responded to it and written bits of poetry that, as it were, hold hands with the Lake Isle of Inish Free or quote it or look back to it. One of which uh, I wrote um, during the first lockdown, and um, the other of which is in fact about C.S. Lewis. So I thought I might just f finish while you're here by reading them both, since you've now got the the Lake Isle of Inishfree in your mind. Then this will. So this is this is um, section five of my quarantine quatrains. Um, uh, uh, with those lovely illustrations by, by Roger Wagner, another artist I'm privileged to know. So it's about Sabbath, it's about rest. On Sunday morning, standing on my lawn, I bless the kindling of this Sabbath dawn, and do not seek withdrawal from the world, since all the world itself is now withdrawn. In Piccadilly Circus, still a stone, its central hub become a quiet zone, Eros may loose his arrow as he will, the little love god languishes alone. From marble arch and all along the moor, only the pigeons still stand sentinel, 
and all the streets that thronged with rush and fret are soaked in silence, almost magical. No need to find the Isle of Inishfree, or seek with Brendan islands in the sea, for now the town and countryside alike partake the Sabbath rest of Galilee. And all that smudge of noise, the muffled roar of distant rush hour traffic is no more. The roadway and the pavement grey both keep a greater silence in the deep heart's core. So I deliberately quote that great phrase of Yeats, but I also quote the roadway and the pavement grey. Yeats had to stand in the midst of Fleet Street on the pavement grey and yearn out to the silence of the Lake Isle where you could just, all you could hear were the bees and the bee loud glade. But it struck me that during that first wave of the pandemic he could have had just as much peace standing on Fleet Street. So there was that, so I, I was a little nod to and a little debt to, to Yeats there, but just as a last thing, I wrote a sonnet um, celebrating C.S. Lewis for when, when Lewis was finally um, honoured in Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey and I was asked to speak at St Margaret's Westminster as part of all of those celebrations. I gave a lecture about Lewis but I decided to finish it with a poem and again this is very deliberate um, because Lewis honoured Yeats. I mean he disagreed with some of Yeats's later ideas and feared he'd become something of a magician but he certainly loved his poetry. Um, so this is my poem which is really about C.S. Lewis but it just touches a phrase of Yeats. C.S. Lewis From Beer and Beowulf to the Seven Heavens whose music you conduct from sphere to sphere you are our portal to those hidden havens whence we return to bless our being here. Scribe of the kingdom Keeper of the door which opens unto all we might have lost Ward of a word hoard in the deep heart's core, telling the tale of love from first to last. Generous, capacious, open, free, your wardrobe mind has furnished us with worlds through which to travel. Whence we learn to see along the beam and hear at last the heralds sounding their summons through the stars that sing, whose call at sunrise brings us to our king. So in a way, both of those poems, that Lewis one and a bit of my quarantine quatrains, come out of and owe a little of their, gen their, 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 their genesis um, uh, to that rich, rich phrase of uh, Yeats's, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Anyway, lovely to see you.